Greetings. So this is the Copy That Floppy episode number two and three, talking about Amiga and Atari ST. First off, this is a revised version of the video that I sent, I released yesterday. I got some great feedback uh, that it wasn't up to par with what it needed to be. And so I walk through more of the details, add a little more information to this, and go through a few more methodologies that I've used in order to get floppy disks or online disk images onto floppy disks for both the Amiga and the Atari ST. This is by no means a complete list. There are probably many, many other ways to do this. I go through three different methodologies, four different methodologies uh, in total that I've used for the Amiga and the Atari ST. Two for the, uh, three for the Amiga and three for the Atari ST. One, two are common between the two of them. All right, let's get into the actual video here. And thank you to the viewer yesterday or this morning, whenever it was, who, who took a look at the video and uh, gave me some very awesome direct feedback. All right, let's get to it. Copy that floppy. Copy that floppy. Copy that floppy. Greetings, and welcome to The Power of Vintage. In today's episode, we're going to talk about creating floppy disks. Uh, not just creating floppy disks, really, the floppy disks, we don't, we're not creating them, but actually getting software on those floppy disks that we can run in the Amiga or the Atari ST. We talked about the Atari 8-bits last time uh, with a methodology that I use, a very hacky methodology, but it works, right? And we'll talk about some other methodologies, a couple different methodologies, actually three different methodologies to get software for the Amiga and the Atari ST ready to go. I'm going to dig into and deep dive into one versus the others. But the first question is why? why? Why do you want floppy disk media? And let me just uh, explain it really quickly. This whole hobby of vintage computing is, in my mind, for, for me, is all about the nostalgia factor. Bringing back, bringing, taking me back to times that were simpler. When I was a child, a teenager, and having these fun experiences, again, in a simpler time. And there are a lot of different things that take us back, right? There can be music, there can be smells, whether it's food, whether it's whatever it is. These things can take us back. Sound? And touch can also do the same. And the experience of that thunk with a floppy disk, that's part of the nostalgia factor. And in my mind, that's one of the, the cool things that brings back those memories. We can all complain about the disk swapping that we experienced <laughs> in our youth playing with these, these old computers. But that said, that's part of the experience. And that's part of that nostalgia that brings back those memories. Now, there are three things that need to take place in order to make certain that we can have software on floppy disks that we can actually use. Number one, you need to figure out how to get the media, how to get a floppy disk, because you need something to write onto, right? You need workable, usable floppy disks. That's step number one. Step number two, you need actually the data, the disk images, for lack of a better term, the software to put onto those floppy disks. And then lastly, you need a methodology to get the software from say your modern PC onto these floppy disks that you can use in your vintage computers. I, we don't have necessarily those bridges anymore. And those bridges between those modern computers and those old computers don't exist necessarily. It's not as simple as just putting a US, plugging in a USB floppy disk drive into your modern computer and then hitting go. It, it's not quite that simple. 
So we'll talk about those three things. All right, let's get started with item number one. So the first step is to get some material, raw material, in order to write disk images to. So that would be the floppy disks as you see here. There's a couple different places where you can get them. Obviously, you can get them from Amazon, from eBay. They're no longer manufactured new, so you're looking for new old stock or used stock, used certified stock, right? You can also get them from various different purchases that you may, may make over time. And then lastly, uh, one of the places where I found the most success is actually through local uh, recyclers, computer recyclers. And they'll oftentimes have floppy disks because no one really wants them anymore, and they get rid of them there. And so that's a, that's the best source that I found them. And to, and to be honest, this is also one of the areas where I actually, when I first started in the collection of vintage computers, I didn't have a whole lot of floppy disks. And I didn't want to erase any of the historical ones that I had from when I was growing up, which weren't a ton, but that was still something that I had there. So this is, this is a summary of the three different methodologies of where you can potentially get floppy disks. All right, so where do we find the .st or .adf files to write to your floppy disks? In this case, I'm going to go to the TOSEC. This is uh, Internet Archive, archive.org. And here, this is the Atari ST. Just search out TOSEC. I'm not sure exactly what TOSEC stands for, but that said, it is a an archive of a tremendous amount of images. In this case, I think they thirty yeah thirty two thousand images. There's a lot of duplicates in the images, so yes, it's thirty two thousand images, but there's multiple different versions of cracked images, etc. Simply select the zip, download the zip. This is 13.9 gigs. This is a lot of a, a lot of uh, disk images. There's a covered magazine cover discs. There is all sorts of stuff that's out there, and it's in a zip format. All right, so that's where that where you find the Atari Tosec. Now, the Amiga Tosec also exists. Similarly, there's in this case this is even bigger, uh, 37.7 gigs. What you'll see here, they see in the reviews here down below. Some files are corrupted or don't work. That is the case with all of these. Not everything will work the way you want it to. And uh, you just kind of kind of do a trial and error to find the files that actually work. Now you can also search up individual quote unquote ROMs or ADF files or .st files just by searching a specific uh, file name. You can type in, you know, ultima4.st download. <laughs> Now, there's all sorts of places where you can find the, those things. I'm not going to say that they're all fantastic or, or wonderful, but this is where, these are the areas where I have gotten the vast majority of images that I use. All right, now to get the software you downloaded onto a floppy disk. I'm gonna first walk through the two I'd say somewhat unique versions of doing this. First the Amiga, then the Atari ST. All right, so I wasn't able to get the Im image capture working, but as you can see here, I'm using a, a, my Amiga 600. And what we're going to do is we're going to transfer files from my PC using this PCMCIA cards, card adapter, flash card adapter. Plug this guy in, and then using the software Easy ADF, because it's easy, transfer that file and write it to a floppy disk. What we're going to do here is we're going to go to media. There we go. Easy ADF. There we go. So what we're going to do is we're going to take Silkworm. I like Silkworm. We're going to transfer this ADF to floppy. Again, this is sourced from the same source material I talked about before from the TOSEC file. And so we're going to transfer this over to a floppy disk. Disk's already formatted, so I don't need to worry about formatting the disk. And we're just going to write the disk. Boom. As simple as that.
It's now writing the floppy disk. As simple as that. Easy ADF. I'm sure there's other software packages you can use. I'm using Easy ADF because this is what I've I've had and it works great. It shows the floppy disk is initial, uninitialized, but it's perfectly fine. In the case of the Atari ST, the nice thing with the Atari ST is that the floppy disk format is compatible with PCs, which means we can use a PC floppy drive and a PC in order to write to that floppy drive. All right, this software package, Flow Image, is one that I've used before in the past, and have I don't use it too much in large part because it's a bit clunky to get that big old PC out in order to do this. You need actually a uh, a floppy header driven floppy disk drive. There are a few USB floppy drives that can use this and work properly, but the vast majority cannot. So uh, I use an old PC in order to do this. Uh, this software is put together by Pipera, who's also put together some really other cool things for the Atari ST, including a hard disk driver, as well as adapting a large number of floppy disk games to, to run on a hard disk. Super cool. In addition, what you can do here, right, this is, this is simple, just taking a floppy image and, and copying it to a physical floppy, or, or you can actually take a physical floppy and create an image from it. Uh, that said, the functionality, this, this works. It's not the most successful. The success I've had is the hit rate is probably 40 to 50% of the images can I actually get to write, write to a floppy and actually function. And, and that's a, a, a for a combination of reasons, but in general, I, it's not the best hit or miss. It's a bit hit or miss. And here I am actually loading up an image. I'm loading up uh, Ultima 2. This is one that I actually did fairly recently. What you see here is you see, I, I this is a single-sided floppy disk, so cylinders 80, sides 1, sector track, for track 9, and then I can simply click on that image to floppy, and then in that older computer, it would simply write to the floppy disk and then be usable. As simple as that. All right, so now let's go to those methodologies that are somewhat common between the Atari ST and the Amiga. And the first one, and the most roundabout one, it's not perfect, is to simply use a GoTech. So this is a GoTech I have that's uh, an external floppy drive style for the Atari ST. And you can simply use copying software and, and treat the floppy images just like disks that are being copied from the GoTech to the physical floppy drive on those computers. All right, so we're gonna just walk through the process to get a file or get a disk image from a GoTech to a floppy disk. This is the least successful method that I have had, um, but it works with cracked images on a pretty regular basis for me. So I, I, I should demonstrate this because this is one way, if you, if you already have a GoTech, you already have a floppy disk drive. This is something that you can at least try. Lowest success level, um, but it works for the Atari ST. I'm certain it would work for the Amiga because the floppy disks are basically disk images as they stand. Now you, you can use disk copy, you can use any number of different software programs, X copy for the Amiga. It, will it work, will it won't work, will it not work? It, it's a mixed bag in my experience, but I wanted to show it. So what we have here on disk image one, this is set up as the secondary drive, the GoTech is. It, is got, it has Dungeon Master selected. I have a blank floppy. I have a bunch of these blue blank floppies. So just so you know, it's not the same disk, I promise you. It's a new one this time. Just formatted, made looking pretty. All right, so we're through the OSSC and we go. And I apologize for the image. The image on the screen here it isn't the best, but it's in large part because my OSSC is set up for the Falcon and I haven't adjusted it for this Atari ST at all. But this is a bigger image. I still can't get the image capture to work at the moment. I, I'm doing something wrong, I'm sure. But that's that said, here we are. So what I'm gonna do now, so we can take a look, floppy disk B, this is Dungeon Master on the GoTech. Floppy disk A 
is fully blank, as you can see. And all I'm going to do is just copying disk, to disk B to disk A. As simple as that. You can use more complex copy programs, copy software. This works fine. As you can see, it's reading through each of the tracks. And this is a double-sided image, this cracked image of Dungeon Master. So you do need, in this case, an, an SF314 or another double-sided floppy disk for this. You can't use a single-sided, even though the original Dungeon Master is a single-sided floppy disk. Let's read it all up. Now it's going to start writing. All right, we are done. Now the next step I'm going to take is I'm going to boot from that floppy disk. All right, I've disconnected the GoTech. The floppy disk is still in the floppy drive. And now we're just going to boot it up. See where we go. Again, this is a cracked image of Dungeon Master. So there should be a crack show that you see first off. We'll skip through that. Get the FTL. All right, there we go. Fully working, cracked version. This is one other method that you can use. Again, lots of different methods, lots of different ways in which this works or does not work, but the GoTek works as an external drive for both the Amiga and the Atari ST in this fashion. Now, the last method that you can use in order to do that, and it's common between both the Amiga and the Atari ST, as well as with the Macs and IBMs and whatnot, is to use one of these. And this, while well, this looks like just a fat floppy disk drive, well, as you can see, the color doesn't match. This is a 3D printed case, but what this contains is a 1.44 megabyte floppy disk drive, along with a PCB called a grease weasel. And the PCB allows for a very fine control of this floppy disk, disk drive. And that can be used in conjunction with software. The software is what controls it, right? Controls the floppy disk drive and, and to f actually pull off the magnetic images. You can, you can write to those floppy disks the same way you would with this PC or with this Amiga using ADF files or with the .st files. But you can also create flux models or flux files, whatever you want to call it, images that you can then write back perfectly, perfectly replicate the images or as perfectly as you possibly can to a floppy disk. And this allows for some pretty cool things. In the case of what I'll, what I'll demonstrate here is I'll demonstrate writing a, uh, a floppy disk image. This, uh, we'll use the Atari ST as an example, but this is perfectly applicable to Amiga's, Macintosh's, um, PC's, PC floppy disks as well but I'm gonna walk through kind of copying from a, an image file to a floppy disk, but then also taking the next step further and actually reading from an original floppy disk and reading that HFE, creating an HFE of a flux image, 
uh, from an a dun, dun, original copy of Dungeon Master, which uh, from what I hear is, is one of the benchmark copy protections from that time, and then create a perfect image of that original file on a floppy disk. All right, let's go to the next part. Now, speaking of the Grease Weasel, this is um, basically the GitHub starting page that you can go to. And, and there's a couple different ways you can come about getting one of these. It comp comprises two different aspects. You have the actual physical hardware, and then you have the software that drives that hardware. That physical hardware consists of, number one, you need a floppy disk drive. Number two, you need a PCB with the appropriate components on it, the grease weasel itself. And there's a couple different ways in which you can actually do that. You can build your own grease weasel using the open source information that's available to get your own PCB made and then source the components and build it and program it, etc. Or you can simply purchase a grease weasel. And that's the way that in which I did that. Now, this is where I began my, my journey because... I had purchased my Grease Weasel. So I would download the software package and then simply extract it into a folder. You can run the gw.exe file, uh, executable, and then run from the command line any of the commands in order to drive that Grease Weasel. Simple as that. What I then decided to do is because I'm not the best with command line and don't want to keep typing in things and wor worrying about that, there's a great wrapper that goes on the outside. This is the Grease Weasel GUI put together by the gentleman there. Um, it's It works well. <laughs> there are so many different uh, things, toggles, switches, or um, commands that you can give to the Grease Weasel that this this really tremendously helps out for me in particular. So this is how I got the Grease Weasel started and, and how I actually put it together. All right, now once we have that Grease Weasel software downloaded, you'll extract it into a folder. In this case, this is what we've done here. In addition to the Grease Weasel software, you also want to extract the Grease Weasel GUI if you're going to use the GUI into the same location. If you want to run the command line, you can run the command line from that as well. But in my case, I'm running it from the, the actual uh, the GUI in this case. There's so many things you can do with this software. I am today only going to focus on two main elements. This is the read from disk and the write to disk elements. And we're going to start by writing to a disk, an Amiga disk in this case. So we'll select that. And now we're going to erase empty the disk. And then this is just simply making certain that I've selected this as drive, mine's set up as drive B. And then you can, you can select the disk type, but in reality, you don't need to do that if the file is properly named. So I'm going to be pulling up Rick Dangerous, a very specific Rick Dangerous image for the Amiga. So if I pick an Amiga ADF file, it will automatically change the disk type to ADF. It does that automatically. And then on the right-hand side, you can go to Format. And what you see here is you see all the different types of formats that you can select from. There's a whole slew of them. And I'm going to select Amiga, Amiga DOS. But as you can see with the Atari, and we'll show that a little bit later with the Atari ST, is you, you have to be a little more prescriptive uh, as to what Atari ST image you're going to use in, in, in many instances. If, and that uh, depends upon the size of the image you're going from. So now we're going to launch into this and start writing. All right, that disk is done. We'll test it out in a minute. The next thing we're going to do is we're actually going to read from an original floppy disk. This is the Dungeon Master original floppy disk for the Atari ST, a highly copy protected disk. And the nice thing is, is it this, this grease weasel will allow me to duplicate that disk, copy protection and all, onto a new floppy disk. And what you see here, now we're reading. And so we're reading from this floppy disk. And there's a couple different selections you have to make. You have to make certain that you select a bit rate because we're going to be reading to an HFE. This is a flux image, and as you can see here, this is D master 
.hfe is the file name that I'm going to save to on my desktop. And the data type, you want to make certain that's just plain HFE, at least for the moment. That's the HFE type 3 doesn't has seems to have issues. So I select data type, just type HFE. And then we're also going to see, as you can see, yeah, that's the bitrate. You got to make certain that you have that for an HFE file file type. And then as you see a little further down to the right, as my mouse moves over there, there we go. We have unspecified format. We don't want to constrain ourselves. Initially, you know, I, I've done this improperly before by selecting an, a disk image type or format type. What you want in this case with uh, this kind of a disk is I want an unspecified format. This will read absolutely raw data, raw flux data. And we will then move on to simply launching. Now that we've gone through that process, we now have that file, the HFE file, ready to be written. We're going to then want to click back, insert the new floppy disk, and move on to write. And this is going to be a little bit different than what you saw when we're writing from a .adf or even a .st image. So we're going to select the file. This is on my desktop dungeonmaster or dmaster.hfe. You want to make sure you change that disk type from that version equals three. I'm not sure why, but it, it doesn't work that way. So I just select the .hfe file. And we have to be thoughtful about, again, this is not an Amiga DOS format. We have to select, you normally would want to select the Atari 360 because it's a single-sided floppy disk. However, we need to have it as an unspecified format because we're writing the, the raw data. We're not trying to structure it in an Atari ST fashion necessarily. And then we click on launch and go. And it starts writing. All right, the floppy disk is written and completed. And uh, let's, we'll need to test it out next. Here is the Amiga 1000 here. We have two floppy disks. One is Silkworm, one is Rick Dangerous. Let's see how they work out. One was used was made using the Grease Weasel, Rick Dangerous. The other one was used using the Easy ADF software for the that's used on the Amiga itself. And let's start them out. All right, let's see what happens. doesn't like it. Well, first one, a fail. Now this goes back to the point I made earlier is that some of these images, they just don't want to work. Let's see if this one goes. And this is Silkworm, I believe. <laughs> so this, this is part of it. You got to find images that will work. It's not just the process. It's also the images themselves. I will go back and try to find a better image. All right, here are two new images, both created using the same methodologies as before. On the right, we have Dungeon Master. This was created using Easy ADF, using a file transferred using the, uh, via the PCM, PCMCIA slot on my Amiga 600. This one here is Ultima 4, just formatted the same disks. This one is, was created using the Grease Weasel using an ADF image as well. Now that said, the, the issues you ran into previously, I intentionally picked images that I knew didn't work <laughs> or I haven't been able to get work properly. There are images you're gonna find online that will not work no matter how hard you try. And so you just gotta find, that's why there's multiple images of the same files, of the same games in particular, uh, is, at least for me. So, all right, so let's start with this one here. I think this is Dungeon Master. They're the same. I didn't write anything down to the discs. There's no label. We'll see. But again, Ultima 4, Grease Weasel, Dungeon Master, ADF file. Ah, this looks like Ultima 4, I think. So this will be the Grease Weasel one if this is Ultima 4.
there we go. We got Ultima 4. Grease Weasel worked. Now, let's swap out for Dungeon Master and we'll see if the easy ADF written one works. So, as you can see, this one will work. Uh, I intentionally picked images that did not work and images that did that I knew worked in order to just demonstrate the fact that images you find online, not all will work. Some actually work fine in GoTeX, but may not work uh, to write disk images. I'm not sure exactly the reasons why, but that said, that is my experience as it's been. Let's load it through the end. I'll fast forward this one. This, uh, this game takes a while to load up. And here we are in game. Here we go. They work. All right. This is the original Dungeon Master floppy disk that I took the image from. I then proceeded to write that image to this floppy disk. Let's plug it in. This is not a cracked image. This is the original. And listen to that lovely floppy drive sound. Here we are, loaded up. We'll just pulse through this real quick. Grab a character. Make sure everything works. And it's looking like it's working just fine. Let's take a look. Oh no! All right, working great. This is the floppy disk that I just copied the image from uh, online. This was the .st file for Rick Dangerous. This was a cracked image but it created a nice little floppy disk here. Now, I hope this helped out, this video helped you out, or at least was informative or enjoyable at least, right? I, this helps to bring back the whole nostalgia factor of using a floppy disk. And being able to do that without having to go onto eBay, Facebook Marketplace, and trying to find original disks that you hope will work, right? You're not assured that any of these will work. This will help get you to the point where you can get something that can work. The Grease Weasel is a great tool. Um, honestly, I think it's probably the best bet across the board. Uh, it's the, it is, there is some cost associated with doing that. You can build your own, that's great. But to be fair, it's less costly than saying getting a, if you don't already have an Amiga 600, getting an Amiga 600 or Amiga 1200 in order to use the, uh, uh, the PCMCIA card slot to, to pull, to write ADFs, so, or even getting an old vintage computer that perhaps it's a similar cost to getting a, a vintage computer that can actually write to floppy disks. So that said, this is an option. And I hope you liked this, enjoyed it. Um, please like and subscribe if you did. If you didn't, comment below, tell me why you didn't like it. And uh, 
I'm gonna sit here, play a little uh, Rick Dangerous. It's a fun game. Not the best of this. <laughs> 